my talk. So um, today I'm going to be, as I said, talking about vocabulary. Um, and the title of my presentation is this, um, The Garden of Words, How to Help Your Students Grow Their Vocabulary. So I'm just saying, yeah, I think, oh, thank you very much, follow you in speak up. Oh, that might be a different Rachel Roberts, actually. I think I've heard um, that there's another Rachel Roberts who writes for Speak Up magazine, so I'm not sure that's me. Um, hi, so people here from all over, from Ukraine, Peru, Ecuador, Egypt, Spain, Brazil, Poland, Italy, Turkey, wow. So it's wonderful to see so many people here and also following the live stream on Facebook. So today I'm going to be talking to you about um, how we can help students grow their vocabulary. So we often talk about growing vocabulary and I think that there are some parallels with gardening. Um, you know, when we're gardening, we scatter lots of seeds um, or words, if you like, but we don't know how many of them are actually going to germinate or grow. Um, so what can we do to help them grow? What can we do to make the soil, um, i.e. the students' brains, if you like, more fertile? Um, how can we help the students to harvest what they've learned? So these are some of the questions that I'm planning to discuss in this webinar. So before I start, yes, we do need green fingers with words. Good idea. I'll add that metaphor in too. So before we start, um, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so this webinar is recorded. Um, a link to the recording will be sent straight after the session. And within three days after the event, um, you will receive your certificate, a personalized certificate um, and a virtual goodie bag. Uh, Oksana says, Rachel can speak five languages. That's great. Yes, but I don't speak them all very well. <laughs> Let's be honest about this. I can speak or I can speak five languages to different degrees. I can get by in five languages. So. Um, Let's start off with a little task uh, for you, okay? So something to think about. Um, what do these figures refer to? So have a guess, um, put your ideas um, in the chat box. Some of them you may recognize instantly, others you may have to guess. I've given you the first one to get you started. So 2000 is the average number of different words that a native speaker uses in a day. What do you think 3000 refers to, 5000 and the rest? It's all to do with vocabulary. I'll give you that as a clue. Right, so put your guesses in the chat box. Some good guesses coming through, thank you. Uh, no, it's not all about native speakers. Some of it is. Okay, so there's some very good guesses coming through. I'll give you the answers now. Okay, so 2000, as I said on the previous slide, is the average number of words that a native speaker uses in a day. I mean, the average number of different words, of course. Um, so 3,000 um, is usually considered to be a good basic vocabulary. If you know 3,000 different words or word families, then you have enough to kind of get by um, and do most things. 5,000 um, is the kind of working vocabulary that you would need at upper intermediate level. So you're doing a bit more than just getting by at this level. You can read more complicated texts, you can deal with more challenging situations. Um, eight to 9,000 words is the number of words that, um, according to Paul Nation, who's written a great deal about vocabulary, that you need in order to be able to read just about anything, to be able to read novels and newspapers. And then 20,000 to 30,000 is the average vocabulary of an educated native speaker. 
And a million plus is the number of words currently in use in English. And that is a lot, you know, more than a million words currently in use in English. So you probably already know that um, English has a particularly large vocabulary. Um, there are quite a few different reasons for this. Um, one of them, of course, is the fact that English um, is a kind of hybrid language. Um, it's been influenced by Anglo-Saxons, by the Normans, by the Romans. Um, and so often we have more synonyms than you might find in other languages because we might have an Anglo-Saxon word, a Norman word, um, a Latin word for the same kind of thing. Um, the other reason perhaps is that we tend to have a lot of technical vocabulary uh, in English. So there are different reasons for this, but it does mean that we do have a lot of words in our vocabulary. Clearly, most of which even an educated native speaker doesn't know um, because we don't all know a million plus words. So the average vocabulary of an educated native speaker is between 20 and 30,000. So I was very um, smug and pleased with myself when I did this online vocab test um, at a site called Test Your Vocab. And they told me that apparently my vocabulary size is estimated to be over 37,000 words. Now, I'm not just telling you this in order to show off. Um, I'm telling you this because I think it's quite interesting why um, my vocabulary is a bit higher than the average. Um, and what it means is that I know uh, words like this word on the screen. I know what it means. It actually means um, gloomy and dark. Right? Now, the reason that um, I know this word, I think, and that I have a higher vocabulary, I think there are two main reasons. One is that I do speak um, some different languages and probably my best second language um, is Portuguese, which is a Latin based language. And so I know quite a lot of words that come from Latin as a result. Um, the other reason I think is that um, I studied literature at university. And certainly, if, you know, if we go back to Shakespeare, if we look at um, Victorian literature, there are a lot of words in there which are not commonly in use nowadays, uh, such as this word here. Right? So I think this is why I have this higher level of vocabulary. Right? But um, these kinds of words, Latin-based words, are not necessarily used that commonly um, in everyday English. And although I did know what this word meant, um, I, I'm not sure that I've ever actually used it myself productively. Um, and I discovered that I don't actually know or I didn't actually know how to pronounce it. Um, it's, I thought that it was tenebrous, which probably comes from the fact that I can speak some Portuguese, and that's how I would expect it to be pronounced in Portuguese. But in fact, apparently, it's tenebrous. So, can we really say that I know this word if I've never used it actively and if I don't know how to pronounce it? So this is the problem with these sorts of tests. Um, somebody was asking, you know, where to test. This is, this is the website if you just Google test your vocab. I think it's testyourvocab.com. But the problem with this kind of test is that it doesn't really tell you what your vocabulary is because just because you can recognize a word and you think you understand what it means doesn't necessarily mean that you can really say that you know that word. So, you know, what does it actually mean when we say we know a word? Uh, let's take a much simpler example than tenebrous. All right? Let's take the word cheese. OK, now I'm sure all of you know the word cheese. Right. So what does it mean when we say we know it? OK, so you understand, I'm sure, that it's a product made from milk, uh, that it's solid, not liquid. It's usually yellow or white. Um, it's, you can probably spell it, I'm sure you can spell it correctly, 
you can pronounce it correctly, right? you can use it in a sentence. You, you will also know that it's an, usually an uncountable noun. We usually talk about some cheese, but we actually can also talk about a cheese if we're talking about different types. Um, but what about if someone says that something is cheesy, um, meaning, you know, that it's um, a bit sort of cliched or that someone is a big cheese, right? meaning that they're a very important person or that someone feels cheesed off, uh, meaning, you know, that they feel annoyed. Right? So even quite simple words like cheese, there's quite a lot to know. And some of that's more productive and some of it, some of it that, sorry, is more receptive and we just kind of recognize it when we see it. And some of it is productive and we can use it confidently. So this is why it's difficult when um, people ask questions about how many words students should learn in a lesson, for example, because it's very hard to say because it depends what you mean by learning a word and knowing a word. Where do you draw the line? So it's not as it's not a linear or predictable process learning vocabulary. So Ibrahim says, I've met many cheesy people. <laughs> that sounds unfortunate, but there are a few, aren't there, around? OK, so um, how do you think that going back to the word tenebrous, how do you think that I learnt that word? Do you think it was incidental learning or deliberate learning? Put in the chat box what you think. So I've got one incidental, both deliberate question mark. OK, all right. So uh, you've read Mary Shelley. Yes, I have, actually. So I would say it is both, I think, to a degree, certainly now. But I would say to begin with, it was probably mostly incidental. And so what I mean by incidental is that um, I came across that word in different contexts. Um, one that I found where I'm sure I would have seen it was in Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, for example. Um, so I saw examples of this word in different places and that helped me to understand what it meant and also how to use it. But it didn't, of course, teach me how to pronounce it um, because I was reading it. Um, so most words we learn as native speakers incidentally. Right? We hear our parents say them, we read them in books, um, we hear other people say them, teachers, our friends, and we learn it incidentally. And that's a very good way to learn vocabulary. Um, because when we come across lots of examples of it in different contexts, we learn a lot about how to use that word. Um, so we learn about the grammar of it. We learn about the spelling, the register, when it's appropriate to use it or not. But learning vocabulary in this way takes a long time. Um, and it also requires you to be exposed to a lot of language. Um, whereas learning vocabulary deliberately, and by learning it deliberately, I mean actually deciding consciously to learn an item of vocabulary rather than just coming across it. So learning vocabulary, vocabulary deliberately definitely helps us to learn a lot more um, lexical items a lot faster. However, we might not learn as much about how to use those words and we might not learn as much about the context. So ideally, we need both approaches. We need both deliberate learning and incidental learning. And um, yes, I think, as Christina says, in fact, with this word tenebrous, I originally, I think, learned it incidentally. But then when I was looking it up for this webinar, I started to do some more deliberate learning because I learned that I had been pronouncing it incorrectly. And so I taught myself deliberately to say it correctly, to say tenebrous. OK, so it's a bit of both. And that is ideally what we want. <laughs>
question. So um, I said I would be showing you um, some examples from the course book series that I've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, it's called High Note and it's an upper secondary series. Um, and this is an example from level four, which is the upper intermediate level. So here we have a set of vocabulary. If you look at exercise three, um, so these are some words in the box. That's our set of vocabulary that we want the students to learn, ideally. Um, and it's a combination of incidental and deliberate approaches to learning. So what happens first is in exercise two, they listen to a podcast um, about um, conspiracy theories. And this vocabulary, um, if you can't, if you can't see it, I can't make it bigger, I'm afraid. Um, if you can't make it bigger on your screen, I will describe to you um, what's there. OK, that's the best I can do, I think. So the vocabulary is words like um, abduct, assassinate, bizarre, um, clues, enigma, expose. So they're all related to the topic of conspiracy theories. So first of all, the students listen to a podcast about conspiracy theories and that vocabulary is in there. So, oh, it has been made a bit bigger. Great. OK. Um, so this vocabulary then is... Um, in the podcast, so they are exposed to it and they may learn some of it incidentally. Right? Then um, the students focus on the vocabulary in exercise three. They check they understand the words from the podcast in the box um, and they find some synonyms for each word. Um, so, for example, um, fake is a, the synonym is fraud. OK, um, so students are working with the words there. So this is now becomes deliberate learning, OK, because they have um, they're focusing on it and they're looking at the meaning of it. Then in exercise four, we're still looking at deliberate learning because the students have to complete the gaps in the questions with an appropriate word from exercise three. But these questions are actually comprehension questions related to the podcast. So they listen to the podcast again and answer the questions. And that then is back to incidental learning again, because they're hearing the words, but they're actually focused on the meaning of the podcast and on answering the questions. OK, so we also um, go on in the lesson to look at some grammar and when the students practice the grammar um, which we can't see now because we've gone a bit too big but when the students practice the grammar some of this vocabulary is still recycled oh, okay yes yeah, so we can see it now so in this text about um, the conspiracy theories behind princess diana's death we can see that some of the vocabulary is then repeated so you know we've got assassinated maintain expose so let's just take one word uh, from this lexical set. Um, so we've got um, bizarre is one of the words. And let's follow that through the rest of the unit. OK, so these three examples here um, come from three different lessons in the rest of the unit. So in the first one that says active vocabulary, um, that's a focus on collocations. But in the examples, we've managed to recycle one of these items again. So we have a bizarre theory, which is quite a common collocation for students. Um, then in the blue one, this is an extract from a reading text. Um, and as you can see, I've highlighted, um, we have a reference to bizarre coincidences. So the word has come up again. The students are likely to notice it and they will see that another collocation there that's very common, a bizarre coincidence. And then in the final one, this is part of the writing lesson that comes at the end of the unit. And they have an example. It's a narrative that they're being asked to write. And they have an example. And in that text, we have another collocation with bizarre. I had the bizarre thought that maybe he was a spy. So this, again, is incidental learning. 
So their students are just being shown and exposed to the vocabulary throughout the rest of the unit. And it will also come up um, later in the book as well, incidentally. And of course, we need to combine this with deliberate learning. So we will have more vocabulary practice activities at the end of the unit. We'll have more practice activities in the workbook and so on. Um, so you can see this kind of combination between both um, incidental learning and deliberate learning. And this is, I think, you know, what, what we need to give students. Um, and of course, you know, as well as drawing, drawing students' attention to um, language that has been recycled, we can do it the other way around. We can also ask the students when they're reading texts not you know we very often ask students to underline words they don't know in a text um, you could try getting them to underline words that they have recently learned in a text so that would be another way of kind of recycling and of keeping those words alive okay so um, we've talked a bit about sort of incidental and deliberate learning but of course some lexical items are harder to learn and require more um, practice and more learning than others. Okay, so here are um, some examples of words that I have struggled with um, in learning Polish. Okay, now I know some people here are from Poland, um, some are not, it doesn't matter because I've put the, the definition uh, next to each of the words in English. Um, although I think I may have got the fourth one slightly wrong. Apparently, it's more to take than to bring. Um, apologies if that's the case. It doesn't really matter. Um, what I'd like you to do is to look at the words in bold and see if you can put in the chat box why you think I find these particularly difficult. All right, so why do you think these are particularly hard to learn? Right. Any ideas? Yeah, so lots of people saying pronunciation. Absolutely correct, yes. Hi from Poland, Marta. Um, Ivan says they aren't. Well, they are for me, okay? <laughs> so why do you think I find them hard to learn? It's not really lack of practice, um, although more practice does help. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so... There are lots of reasons that you have given, which are good reasons why I find these words hard to learn. I probably won't now, of course, because I've looked at them so much in preparing this webinar. But um, so kapalush, I find that hard because it, to me, that should be a cap. All right. And that isn't what it means. It means hat. So it sounds as if it's a cognate, um, but it's not. All right. Um, it has a slightly different meaning. So we often refer to this as a false friend because we think that we recognize it, um, but in fact, we don't. So that can be one thing that creates a higher learning burden for students. Um, yes, somebody said about lots of different versions. Polish has a case system. So therefore, if you learn a word um, such as the word for dog, which is Yes, then you also have to learn all the variations of it, depending on um, whether you're, it's accusative or dative or vocative or locative, etc. the different cases. So obviously this is confusing and I find this one particularly confusing because I suppose it's quite a short word and so all the words are very, very similar. So it's not just a question of me using the correct case. It's also a question of me remembering the correct version of that word. Um, OK, the next one, I'm now hesitating to say it. And that's exactly the problem. I have huge trouble with pronunciation of some of these words. So I think it's vigeance, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it's clearly quite difficult for me as an English speaker to pronounce quite a few words all right, in Polish. Um, it's also quite difficult to spell. Um, you know, so I kind of find myself wondering, should there be a Y between the W and the Z, for example? All right. So spelling and pronunciation definitely do cause problems if it's difficult for a particular learner. And then um, the last one, 
um, Runka, if I pronounce that correctly. So that means hand, but it also can mean arm, like the whole area. So this has a different, um, what we call a different semantic boundary. So that's quite hard to get the hang of using that because we use it differently than in English. So these are some examples of my difficulties, but these are true um, for any language and, you know, any student. If there are different semantic boundaries in the language you're trying to learn from your own language, that's going to create a higher learning burden. So, for example, um, well, I've given you one example. Another one in Polish would be um, the word booty, which means not just boots, but also shoes. Right? So, the, the way that um, the meaning that is encapsulated by that word is much bigger than it is in English. Um, difficult spelling. Um, in, in some ways, Polish spelling is actually quite easy because it's very logical. Um, if you hear a sound, you have a fairly good idea how you should write that. Not perfectly, but much better than in English, because in English we really don't have very much connection between the sounds and how we spell it. There are lots of different ways of spelling certain sounds. Um, difficult pronunciation. That could cause a problem, like if there are silent letters or it has a difficult sound in it um, or a diff difficult stress pattern. Um, unpredictable grammar patterns. So if a verb is irregular, for example, um, that can make it harder to learn. Um, the example I gave of Polish was the case system, how that changes the nouns and other things, but we won't go into that. Um, if it requires specific coll collocations, um, then that also can make it harder. Um, you know, so if you have to say it with particular words around it or it sounds odd. And then, as I mentioned, false friends can also cause um, problems. Um, yes, I mean, there are dif different examples in, in different languages, obviously. I mean, another one that's quite common is um, something that sounds like library, like libraria, but actually it means a bookshop. So there are those kinds of things. So Esther says, how do you fix that? I'm not sure if you're talking about spelling or all of these problems. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a question of fixing it, but it's about being aware that some words or lexical items, by which I mean maybe a phrase, um, are harder to learn than others. And so they will require more attention, if you like. Um, so let's look at an example. Uh, this comes from high note uh, level two and um, there's a lexical set here in yellow at the bottom um, on the left hand side. So it's personality adjectives. Right. Thank you. Yeah, that's a bit bigger. That's great. So if um, if you were teaching these adjectives to your students um, at this level, this is a sort of pre-intermediate level. Which of them do you think they would find dif difficult? Which do you think would have a higher learning burden for them and why? Now, there isn't a correct answer to this because it will depend very much on your students. Um, but would you like to give me any examples of ones that you think would be difficult? OK, so the longer words with more syllables. Yes, I agree. Uh, caution because of the pronunciation. It absolutely does depend on your mother tongue, yes. Right. Um, so I think we would find it totally depends on what the first language is, but certain things, calm might be a problem for quite a few people because of the pronunciation and the spelling with that silent letter. Um, cautious with the sh sound. Um, you might find that there are some kind of slightly false friends, for example. We don't have nervous in here, but that's an example of a very common false friend because uh, it means something slightly different in English than it does in many other languages. So as teachers, you're aware, I think, you can predict um, which kinds of words have a higher um, learning burden. And so if you know that, then you can give the students more help with that and more practice. Okay, 
Uh, there's also an interesting point. Research shows that um, teaching students words in a lexical set like this, so in a set of words with similar or related meaning, also increases the difficulty for them. Um, and if you think about it, it makes sense because they're more likely to confuse the words um, because they're learning them at the same time. So when I first heard about this research, um, it made me wonder whether perhaps we shouldn't be teaching lexical sets. Um, but then when I thought about it, I thought, no, this is not the case. We, we need to teach in lexical sets because that's the best way to provide context and to get them to practice the words in context. If we had totally unrelated words, it would be very difficult to then use those words uh, within any context. So I think we do need to teach in lexical sets, but we need to be aware that that could actually make it a bit more difficult for them and that we might need to do more um, work in order to help them to learn those words. So what do I mean by work? You know, what do I mean by the work that we have to do? Um, so I think there are four key principles um, in terms of teaching vocabulary. Um, I've got some images here, which I think represent these four principles. So just for a bit of fun, what do you think the images represent in terms of key principles in vocabulary learning? Any ideas? So training, says Elizabeth. Yeah, I think that's a good word. Focus, discovery. Okay. Yeah, great ideas. All right. So I'm just really getting you thinking about this. Um, so this is this is what I came up with, and you have been saying a lot of very similar words um, in the chat box. So the four key principles, as I see it, are noticing. Uh, by which, well, I'll, I'll explain this in more detail, but kind of be, being aware of the words, um, processing, all right, so kind of working with them in different ways, um, repetition, uh, somebody said training and exercise, all right, those are similar, I think, um, and then finally, um, retrieval, which is the process of, you know, trying to remember the words and then using them. Um, the last one, yes, it represents, in my mind, but I was making you guess my mind, it represents, there's a saying in English, um, looking for a needle in a haystack, and it means when you're trying to find something and it's quite difficult to find it. So that's what I mean by retrieval. So I'm going to go through each of these in turn now. Okay, so noticing. Right, so noticing um, in terms of um, the metaphor of the garden that I talked about at the beginning. This is kind of like choosing which seeds we're going to plant or maybe noticing uh, plants we admire in other people's gardens that we'd like to have in ours. Uh, yes, this is a magnolia and I would love to have a magnolia in my garden, but we only have like a very little courtyard garden at the moment, so it's not very practical. But one day I'm going to have a magnolia in my garden. Um, so noticing means more than the lexical item just being in the text that they are reading or in the audio they're listening to. It has to be um, salient for the learners in some way. Right? So salience is a very important um, concept in vocabulary learning. Um, does anybody um, have any idea what salience means? Would you? Can you give me a definition. Okay, yeah, if you speak a Latin language, you might find it easier. Right. Okay, so yeah, we're coming out with some good ideas here, I think. So salience, right, it comes from um, the Latin, and it's about something jumping out at you. So hence the picture of the dolphin, you know, so it's when you you hear something, and a certain part of it really, you really notice it, it jumps out at you. Um, yeah, so Ibrahim's put the definition here. So particularly noticeable or important, prominent, okay. 
Um, yes, yeah, so if you speak a Latin-based language, that will make sense to you because it's it's like salir um, in Portuguese, for example. Okay, so something jumps out at you. So we need to help our students um, by helping those words or lexical items to jump out at them. Right. So um, here is um, an example of the very simplest way that we might do that. Um, so this is an example from High Note again, from level four, um, and it's a text um, about. Well, in fact, it's a an authentic um, text. It's a an extract from a book called um, A Long Way Home, which was made into a film called Lion. And did anybody see that film? It's excellent film, excellent book too. OK, so as you can see in the text, um, don't worry if you can't see the details. It doesn't matter at the moment. Um, some of those words have been highlighted. Um, so when the students read the text and answer the comprehension questions, because this is a, a reading and vocabulary lesson, they will naturally have their attention drawn to those words which have been highlighted. Um, so then when they um, have read the text, they've answered the questions, we can then ask them to look at those words which are in context. And if you look at exercise six, we ask them to complete the table with those words. So they're categorizing them um, into either community um, or poverty. So something like um, huddle together, for example, um, would perhaps go under community. Uh, hand to mouth, which I think is another example, might go under poverty. So this, that's what I mean by students noticing the words. Right? So we're getting them to kind of focus on them and to think about them. They match the words with their definitions. So then they're starting to work with the words and then they use them um, in the final activity to talk about um, how you think poverty influences someone's life and can there be any positive outcomes. So then again, they might be talking about poverty. They could also be talking about community and using that vocabulary. So the simplest way to get students to notice words is simply to um, point them out to them, you know, to highlight them, to do things with them. Um, but there are also other things that we can do um, with vocabulary. Uh, here's an example. Um, this again comes from level four. And here we're looking at vocabulary such as um, crunching, popping, rustling, sizzling, right, chirping. So sounds. And in this exercise, the students listen to the sounds. So that's going to make it more salient for them because we're using their senses. Um, so we can use their senses. We can also use their emotions. Um, in this example, again, from level four of High Note, um, the vocabulary is vocabulary to do with um, kind of failure and success. So words like blunder, flop, flourish, masterstroke. So the students listen to some um, stories about people who have made mistakes, but what they've learned from them. Um, and then they... Um, categorize the words into either success or failure. They do some practice with it and then they talk about their own situations. So when they've kind of, what they've learned from making mistakes. So then they're able to use the vocabulary. So because they're talking about their own situation, because they're talking about something quite um, emotive, that will also help to make the words more memorable and more salient. But the vocabulary here does apply to something that is quite emotional, but it doesn't have to, right? It can, we can use this principle of personalization and emotion with any set of vocabulary, pretty much. Um, you know, let's, for example, if we were teaching a set of different genres of film, um, you know, like a thriller, a comedy, a, um, a romantic comedy, you could get students to come up with examples um, of films that they either really loved or really hated, which were in those genres. And that would help to kind of make the impression upon them of those words deeper, if you like. 
So that's noticing. Processing. Processing is kind of um, the next step on from noticing. And we've already talked a little bit about processing because this is where you start to kind of work with the words. So um, Scott Thornbury in his book, How to Teach Vocabulary, um, says the more decisions a learner makes about a word and the more cognitively demanding these decisions are, the better the word is remembered. So I think this expresses it perfectly um, that we need to get the students making decisions about a word. So using those words in different ways, analyzing them um, and really kind of working with the words. So this is what I mean by processing. Um, so let's see an example of that. OK, so this is um, an example from High Note 4. Um, it's a text about endangered animals, but it focuses particularly on ugly endangered animals um, that people perhaps don't care about that much and why they should. Um, and as you can see, again, we've highlighted the key vocabulary um, and the students, um, when they've done the comprehension work, they then categorize this vocabulary into three categories, um, which is just on the left. Um, so we have um, animals, parts of the body um, and adjectives to describe a creature. So the vocabulary goes into these three categories. So that's a way of working with the words because they have to think about what they mean and which category they should go into. Now, this is an example, obviously, that's been done for you in this book. But um, you can do this with any text. Um, you can either do it yourself um, by thinking about what categories different words could go into, or, and this is much easier and requires a lot less preparation, you could ask the students, you could give them the words that you want them to learn and ask them to sort them into categories. Um, and the process of having to decide what those categories should be will make the students work with the words at quite a deep level, which will help them um, to start learning those words. So we've talked about categorizing. Um, of course, there are other ways that we can get students working with words. This is an example of how we could use synonyms. So if you look at um, exercise four, um, the students have read the blog post, they've answered the questions because they need to understand the context first. We don't usually go straight into vocabulary. Um, and they find adjectives in the blog post and match the adjectives from the box with the synonyms that were in the blog post. So again, we're getting them to work with the meaning of the words. Um, and then, um, in exercise five, um, they replace the underlined adjectives with more interesting ones. So again, they're thinking about the synonyms, which gets them working with the words. Um, Camilla says, why are the activities before the text? I'm not quite sure what you mean, but what I would say is that you should normally do the comprehension activities on the text before you start working on the vocabulary so that they understand the context of those words. Sometimes we might choose to pre-teach a few words, um, but that would be in order to help them um, not get stuck on the text, whereas this is where we're really focusing on the vocabulary specifically. Um, so we've talked about categorizing synonyms. We can, of course, have antonyms. Um, so here's an example of antonyms. Um, we've got some words here in exercise five, which describe um, food in terms of flavor, uh, taste, I should say, and texture. Right. Um, so the exercise in the book is to match the words with the opposites. So we could have thick with runny or watery, uh, crunchy with smooth, savory with sweet and so on. Um, Obviously, you can do this exercise from the book, but um, working with antonyms and also enables us um, to do some further, deeper work looking at um, odd one out. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this kind of exercise before. 
Um, so here are the words from that set. I've divided them into four, th sorry, three sets of four. Um, which one do you think is the odd one out in each case? Have a think about it for a minute. Which do you think is the odd one out? Uh, Sonia thinks about is asking about translation. Um, that's a big question. Remind me at the end and I'll come back to it. OK, so brilliant. You're thinking about this. So as you think about this, you are working with the words, you're processing the words. So I think that for me in the first four, the one I think is the odd one out is mild because the others are all about texture. In the second set, I think the odd one out um, is runny because the others are all about taste. And in the third set, I think the odd one out is bland because that's quite a negative judgment and the others are positive. <coughs> But you could argue something different. So Jandira says sweet is the odd one out. Now, if, if you were a student and you could explain to me why that was the odd one out, and I think you could because you could say the other three were more about savoury dishes, um, that's absolutely fine too. The point here is, is less to get the right answer and more to really think about the meaning of the words. So again, you can get the students creating their own odd one out tests um, and they can set they can write those and give them to other students. And the point is that they will have to be really thinking about the meaning of those words and explaining that to others. And so that will help them to process it at a deeper level. OK, so that brings me to the third point, um, which is repetition. OK, so I think repetition is very important. We know we need to see a word um, lots of times in different contexts. Some people say seven times is ideal. Um, and we also need to use it in lots of different contexts. So in our gardening metaphor, you know, we can see this as like the sunshine and the rain. You know, we need lots of both of those, not just one lot of sunshine or one lot of rain. Right? We also need to understand a bit about how the brain works. Um, so neuroscience is something that I'm very interested in. And I think it can tell us quite a lot um, about the learning process. So the brain is a relatively small part of our body. Um, it's about 2% um, of our whole body weight. Obviously, that varies from person to person, but on average. Um, how much energy do you think the brain consumes as a percentage? So if you, you know, in terms of the calories that you take in, what percentage do you think the brain uses? OK, so we've got lots of guesses here, which is fine. One of you's actually got it right. It's 20 percent. Right? It's not as high as 90 or something, because obviously you've got to, you know, in order to walk and um, that uses a lot of energy. But it's surprising how much energy the brain uses, given how small it is relatively. All right. So it's only 2 percent of our weight, but it uses 20 percent of our energy. And that means that um, the brain tends to be quite um, lazy, if you like. It doesn't want to use more energy than it has to. And so the brain is always looking for ways to make life easier. So if we learn something once and we don't use it again, the brain will decide that we don't need it and it will cut it out. Right, it's called neural pruning, so that's another garden metaphor. So it will kind of cut it out if we're not using it. If we learn something several times over a period of time, then the brain will start to create much stronger and more permanent pathways. So you may have come across something called um, the forgetting curve. All right, this was Ebbinghaus back in 1885. So that's the black line is Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve. So what he discovered was that, you know, if you learn something 100%, um, after 30 minutes, you'll have forgotten about half of it. Um, and after 31 days, you'll only remember about 20% of it. Um, however, if you then go in and learn it again, 
you can see that each time you learn it again, you are more likely to remember it. So after the fourth repetition, um, then after 30 days, you might remember nearly 80% of it. So this is why something called spaced learning has become um, so um, popular because we're starting to understand that you know spending two weeks learning something and then not looking at it again is not very helpful. It's much more helpful to learn something and then come back to it and then come back to it and then come back to it again. And that's what we mean by space learning. So Laura Dana says after a month, why students will forget what they've learned? Yes, they will unless you go back and teach it again or they go back and review it again. So the fourth um, and final key principle is retrieval. All right? And this is quite hard work and it's meant to be hard work. It's like digging something up. Um, so, you know, memorization is um, a key part of learning vocabulary, of course. Um, but it isn't always that helpful to just learn lists of um, vocabulary that isn't in context. Ideally, we want to be learning vocabulary within a context, but we also want to be struggling a bit to try to remember it because that struggle is what tells the brain that this is important and that we better hang on to it. Right. Uh, say, if we work hard, I, my brains will boil. Yes, you want a bit of brain boiling going on. Right. <laughs> so um, this is an example um, from High Note 3, and this is just part of a text, um, a reading text that has some vocabulary in it. So again, the vocabulary is highlighted um, and you can see um, what the vocabulary is that we're trying to teach them. So just have a little look at the text now. I'll, I'll read a little bit of it for those of you who may not be able to see it. Um, so it said, things will probably go wrong, but try to see the funny side. In Spain, we decided to go off the beaten track and visit the ruins of an ancient castle. We hired a car, planned the route, hit the road and got lost almost immediately. OK, so I'll just read you that little bit. OK, so the students read the text and then you can show them um, a version of the text where you have taken out uh, some of the words. So things will probably go wrong, but try to see the funny side. Um, in Spain, actually, I've gone Sorry, I've gone further forward than I meant to. In Spain, we decided to go off the, so what's missing? Any ideas? Put it in the chat box. We decided to go off the, yes, beaten track. Very good. Okay. Um, planned the, what do you think's missing there? Trip. Yes, that's right, Esther. Okay, so the students are having to search their memory for it. And then we can show them a version where there's a bit more missing. Right. So instead of we decided to go off the what's missing, now the whole phrase is missing. We decided to go off the beaten track. Right. So you're forcing your students to work hard to remember, but it isn't just a decontextualized list. It's actually in context. And um, if your students are enjoying this, you know, you can take away more of the words that you can get them to try and remember the whole text if you like. Um, I wouldn't expect them to remember it perfectly by the way if you do that that might take a long time but it's all about kind of getting them to really work hard to retrieve the language and that helps because then the brain decides that these words must be important. Um, okay so we've talked about four key principles in vocabulary then. So we've, we've got noticing, uh, processing, repetition, um, and retrieval. So if we remember those four um, key principles in the things that we do, we'll be helping our students a lot uh, to learn vocabulary. So I started the webinar by talking about um, how it's like gardening. And I think that is a good metaphor, but maybe it's even more um, like farming, because it's really very important um, that students learn vocabulary. Um, there's a, a quote here which goes all the way back to uh, 19, 
72, but it's still very important. Uh, yeah, if we could just um, zoom in, zoom out a bit so we can see the whole quote. Um, so it says, with while without grammar, very little can be conveyed. Um, without vocabulary, nothing can be conveyed. So what it means is that, you know, we spend a lot of time focusing on grammar in classrooms. And of course, you know, grammar is important, but actually it's not as essential as vocabulary. If we don't have the vocabulary, we can't convey anything. Um, so I hope that this webinar has left you ready for a bit of planting, digging, harvesting of vocabulary. Um, and if you have any questions, um, I'm very happy to answer them. We've got a few minutes left. I'll just put the housekeeping slide up again. I make you work very hard. Yes, I think I did. Um, do you think that crosswords, word searches and so on? I think they can be useful if the students already um, have been exposed to the word lots of times in context. And so they really know it pretty well. They just need a little reminder. Um, but I wouldn't do that until they're really quite um, familiar with the words because they're so decontextualized. That's the problem. Um, OK, somebody asked about the book the name of the book it's called high note um oh somebody asked earlier about um translation i'll come to that floriana says is it useful to recycle old vocabulary at the beginning of a lesson as a warm-up yes absolutely i think the more you can kind of recycle words the better um some teachers keep like a, a box in their classroom, a physical box when we get back into classrooms um, with words in it. And when students finish early, they can kind of pull out slips of paper and um, test themselves on it. Um, somebody asked about um, translation. Um, I think um, translation can be quite good if you're looking at short texts because you can see the differences in how things are expressed in English and in the first language. I'm less keen on translating word for word um, because I think it often doesn't help us with memorizing that word because we're focusing on our own language. Um, just see if there's any other questions. Translation, the last resource. I think translation can be good. Um, but in terms of when you're first encountering a word, um, I wouldn't say it's exactly the last resource because sometimes you could spend hours trying to explain something and you could just translate it like that. But it isn't going to be as memorable. Let's put it that way. Um, so to do retrieval, I have to use the same text. No, not necessarily. Retrieval, that's a good question. But retrieval is anything where students have to really think about words and try to pull them out of their memory. Um, so something like a, you know, a running dictation is also quite good for retrieval, where they go up and they see the text, they have to remember it, and then they come back and tell their partners. Um, OK, I'm just looking to see if there's any other questions. So Andrea asked the question, we always get asked, how many words should we teach? All right. Um, the that's a very good question, but unfortunately, there isn't really a clear answer to it because it depends what you mean by teaching a word. Do you remember we said at the beginning about how much there is to know about every word? And so it depends how much they already know about that word. It depends on how much they need to know about that word. So it's actually quite difficult to say. Um, OK, there's a question. Um, from Facebook. Um, oh, okay. Dan says, what are the post-it notes on the cupboard behind you? That's my to-do list, actually. It's um, a Japanese system called Kanban. Um, and the ones on the top are the ones I've done already this week. Um, the ones in the thin band are the three I'm doing today. And the ones at the bottom are those waiting to be done. Um, do you have extra recommendations for retrieval in online classes? Um, I mean, I think um, you can do um, quite similar things online. Um, so you can ask students. Uh, it's about getting students to search their memories for things. So you could do something like we did with like short extracts of text and getting them to kind of put the answers in the chat box, for example. 
Um, it's really about thinking what you would do in class and then how you would turn that into something that would work online. Um, OK, do you think drilling is OK? Yes, um, I'm quite a fan of drilling. Um, I think it helps students to get confident about words, particularly at lower levels. But I don't think that's the only thing that we should be doing because context is so important. And so if we're drilling individual words, they won't necessarily then be able to use them. Ideas for expanding our vocabulary, read, 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 and listen to things. Is reading for pleasure a good way to expose learners to incidental vocabulary? Yes, absolutely, Lara, that's just what I, I was saying. It's the best way, I think. But also watching and listening to things can be as well. Um, what do you think of word of the week idea? Yes, I think it's that's a, an example of making something salient. So if it's word of the week, then students will notice it more. Um, so, yes, that can work very well. Um, how often do you write tests? Um, are you talking about in the book or as a teacher? I think I would say generally with testing, little and often is the way to do it. So don't have like a big test at the end of the year and nothing in between, have, have lots of little tests because each time, you remember the forgetting curve, each time you're helping them to remember it better. Um, any tips for using the learnt words in speaking practice? Well, I think you, you can set it up so that students kind of have to. Um, so if you have a vocabulary set and you ask them to um, speak about that, that topic, you can kind of set it up so that their partner notes down um, how many words they used from that set or something. You can make it a little bit of a game. Um, Ibrahim says about if I don't know the meaning of the word, shall I stop or wait till I finish reading the page? I would say generally it depends on how hard the text is. If there are lots of words that you don't know, it's probably better not to stop because you'll lose the sense of the whole text. Um, and you will probably pick up the meaning through incidental learning if it's repeated a lot of times. If, however, it's, you know, it's just one word um, and it's getting in the way of you understanding the text, then you could stop and look it up. Um, sorry, it's all going very fast. Any resource books you would recommend to enhance students' vocabulary? Um, well, of course, you know, it, it's hard to think off the top of my head, actually, of specific books because it depends on the level of the students um, and their background. Um, yeah. New words in a separate way or in context. I think in context is the absolute, you know, the best way of learning new words. Once they know them to a degree, then I think you can look at them more separately and they can start to learn from a list. But if they don't already know the word, it's going to be much harder for them to remember it and to be able to use it correctly if it's in a decontextualized list. Um, yeah, there are lots of good books on, on vocabulary. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to mention them in a Pearson webinar. That's the only thing. But I did mention the um, Scott Thornbury book on teaching vocabulary. That's a good one. Yeah, Emmanuel says, can we think about chunks to help the students in learning more? Absolutely. I mean, that's why I talked about lexical items quite a lot, because we're not always talking about single words. Uh, yes, I am on I am on Instagram. Um, and, and Facebook, but under Life Resourceful, which is my coaching work. Uh, yes, you can you can find me on on Facebook. Your webinar's bearing fruit already. That's good. So thank you very much. Uh, yes, I think Quizlet's a great tool. Mm -hmm.
So thanks again.